Hello and welcome back to DeepMind, the podcast. Over the last two episodes, we've been exploring DeepMind's goal of solving intelligence, asking what that actually means and travelling along some of the roads that could take us there. This time, it's all about the robots. We'll be exploring the idea of physical intelligence. And to do that, I'll be taking you behind the scenes of the robotics lab in King's Cross, London. You've got three humanoid robots. They're black. They've got a very sort of cuboid body, but they have arms and legs and even little tiny heads. They're quite small, though. They're probably the size of a large chicken. <laughs> yeah, smaller than a goose, bigger than a chicken. <laughs> I'm Hannah Fry, and this is episode four, Let's Get Physical. Now, before our robotics lab passes are activated, let me fill you in on a bit of background. Why would a company known for getting machines to play board games and fold proteins find robotics so alluring? In June last year, I emerged bright-eyed from my lockdown-induced hibernation to visit Cheltenham, a pretty spa town in southwest England. The Cheltenham Science Festival, an annual event attracting the world's leading scientists and thinkers, was the setting for my first in-person interview since the COVID-19 lockdown. And, as luck would have it, my interviewee was Raya Hadsall, DeepMind's Director of Robotics. Ah, it's very nice to be in a room full of people again for a change. Raya knows pretty much all there is to know about robotics and artificial intelligence, starting with the difference between them. When we think about artificial intelligence, a lot of the time people immediately go to a robot as being the instantiation of that AI. Just think about the robots you see in films. C-3PO, Wall-E, Marvin the Paranoid Android. They're all intelligent beings with robot bodies. They're all able to reason about their environment and make decisions. Likewise, our visions of super-intelligent AI long into the future is rarely just a disembodied voice, apart from a couple of exceptions, like in the film Her, for example. Robots and AI are synonymous with one another in many people's minds. But really, the two should be distinguished. AI is a computer program that's usually trained on a lot of data to be able to give answers to questions in a similar way that a human might. So think about being able to translate from French to English to Mandarin. These are the types of problems that an AI might be able to do. A robot, on the other hand, takes actions and changes the world, either manipulation through touching the world and moving things around, maybe doing assembly, or a a robot that can move itself around. And then we can think about the two together as AI being a really natural way to bring us to the next set of breakthroughs for what robots can do. If you heard the first series of this podcast, you'll already be familiar with the idea that robots don't necessarily come with AI built into them. Your dishwasher, your lawnmower, your pressure cooker are all, in the technical sense, robots. They are machines that are capable of carrying out a series of actions automatically. But these aren't the sorts of robots that DeepMind is interested in as a route to artificial general intelligence. Instead, their robots use machine learning techniques to learn for themselves how to perform different tasks. So what does all of this look like? What kind of robots are being trained to saunter around the research facilities, to ground algorithmic experience in the real world and explore the absolute cutting edge of physical intelligence? Well, why don't you come on in? Welcome back to the Robotics Lab. Shall we get started? Yeah, okay. All right. Meet Akhil Raju, a software engineer on the robotics team. You can see the excitement in his eyes as he shows me around the lab, even while the rest of his face is covered by a mask. So this is going to be a little bigger than the last time you were there. Oh gosh, massive. Whoa. Yeah. You know, if you ever go to a trade show, 
and they have like little stalls up in a giant space. It sort of looks a little bit like that. So we're in this big concrete building with lots of glass along one side. And then you've got these little booths all the way along with, <laughs> I mean, they sort of look like privacy screens. But privacy for the humans. Exactly. The robots, yeah. no one cares about the privacy of the robots. <laughs> yeah, the robots can do whatever they want. Yeah, yeah. Inside these mini booths are robotic arms of every size and shape imaginable. Tall, crane-like arms, short and stubby ones, and arms with grippers on the end like the kind you'll see in a games arcade. All of these arms are part of DeepMind's research into getting robots to dexterously manipulate everyday objects. Akil ushered me into one of the booths to take a closer look. So this big arm that is extending out of a table, you know those stand mixers that you get in posh kitchens? Imagine one of those, but like a giant version. So it's kind of quite bulbous and curvaceous with all of these joints and cameras attached to it. And then right on the end, there's a teeny tiny key. And it's, I guess, trying to put a key in a lock. Yep, exactly. This robot has kind of this attachment where it can insert like a USB in, in a USB hole or maybe a key or so on. And so we're trying to learn how to actually do very like fine manipulation. We're taking tasks that you might do in everyday life and we're using that as a challenge. If you wanted to have one of these robots in a factory, say, doing this really fine insertion task, why can't you just pre-program one? Why does it need to be something that has trained itself? If it was a case where it's very fixed settings, we know exactly where the key is, we know exactly where the hole is, then probably, yeah, you can just program it. The thing is, that's not how all factories really are. A lot of factories that might require some kind of an insertion task, like putting a key in a lock, will also have a lot of variables at play so that the lock and key aren't at precisely the same start points each time. And that changes the challenge from being something pre-programmable to something much harder. And what you'll notice actually is when these types of insertions need to happen in a factory, it's not robots that do it in the real world now. It's humans. And that's another reason why we chose insertions as a task, because it's somewhat unsolved by the greater robotics community. You might be wondering how on earth any of this is possible. How do you possibly set up an inanimate robot arm to teach itself to open a lock? Well, by now, it probably won't surprise you that one of the fundamental methods for training physical intelligence is that deep mind favourite approach, reinforcement learning. In the simplest terms, this involves rewarding an algorithm with points for accomplishing a task, like correctly inserting a key into a lock. And there is a reason why robotics is geared up for algorithms based on reinforcement learning. Here's Doina Precup, head of DeepMind's Montreal office. She is a world expert in reinforcement learning. It's very easy to imagine expressing robotics tasks in a reward language because you can observe when the robot is doing the correct thing, let's say putting an object in a particular place. And so it's very easy to phrase the problem as a reinforcement learning problem. And of course, we know from the natural world, animals trained by reward to do complicated physical tasks would like to take that idea to robotics as well. If you want to get a dog to go fetch, you don't carefully explain how it should move each one of its muscles in order to run towards an object, retrieve it and give it back to you. Instead, you reward it with a treat when it does what you want and it learns by itself how best to calibrate its body in the performance of that task. In this way, some of the algorithms inside AI robots are much like dogs, except they're rewarded with numbers, not tasty biscuits. This might make it seem like reinforcement learning is a magic bullet. But in practice, things are a bit more complicated. Physical tasks like inserting a key into a lock are subject to a problem known as sparse reward. If you waited to reward a robot until it had successfully put a key into a lock, just by chance, you would be waiting around for a long time. 
So the robotics team has been looking for other ways of putting their robots on the right track. While the robot is learning to do it, a human comes in and when it gets close but no cigar, a human can take over and just be like, adjust like this, maybe move to the left a little bit. And so while we might have a sparse reward, so it's kind of like, it's all or nothing. You know, you're in the locker, you're not in it. What the robot will use is both that information of sparsity, but also maybe information from a human. And kind of the combination of those things is how it might learn. And while there are certainly areas where learning algorithms like this one have been able to successfully accomplish tasks, you shouldn't be fooled into thinking this stuff is easy because not all the robots in this lab are quite as accomplished. When I was here last, I saw a robot that was stacking Lego bricks. Not to be rude, but I wouldn't say it was the most impressive thing I'd ever seen in my life. (laughs) How's it doing now? We can actually move to the other side of the lab and we can start to see that stuff. Akil took me to another robot cell with a red and black robot arm inside. It had a gripper on the end with two appendages, a bit like the grabby bit of a litter picker, and it was hovering over a tray containing a trio of 3D shapes. Its goal was to learn how to stack the red pyramid shape on top of the blue octagonal prism. So there's only one way round that it can hold this red object and successfully pick it up. And it hasn't worked out which way. And unfortunately, every time it tries to rotate and pick it up, oh, hang on, I think it's got it. It's got it! It's a good job these things don't get disheartened, because, my goodness, it's been how many years since I've been here? <laughs> no, All it, this time. It's been here trying and trying and trying. So we're seeing something that's kind of training right now, so we're not seeing our best. Don't make excuses. But, uh... <laughs> Why are these dexterous manipulation tasks so important to learn? So one of the reasons that we have a robotics lab at DeepMind is really to ground our search for AGI in the real world, to make sure that our progress towards AGI is true AGI. Like if we find AGI, it probably should be able to stack an object on another object. And speaking of objects, next to this row of robot arms, I noticed a basket full of children's toys. Rubber ducks, foam bananas, and a much-loved cartoon character. I noticed SpongeBob is still here, sat in the corner this time. There's also, hang on, little green rubber ducks. (laughs) What's the idea behind this stuff? So these kind of play things are really nice because Manipulating objects that can bend and move and stuff like that, that's a new type of physics that our agents need to learn. Somewhere in a landfill, is there a pile of sort of (laughs) crushed foam bananas that robots have? We haven't destroyed any bananas yet, I can... You haven't destroyed any bananas? I'm happy to say. I don't believe that for a second. (laughs) As fun as it is to watch these robot arms try and fail to insert USB sticks into computers and sling foam bananas around, it's worth remembering that the projects on display in the robotics lab serve an important purpose. Building AI that can interact with the physical world is considered central to the overarching goal of solving intelligence itself. Here's Raya Hadzad again, speaking at the Cheltenham Science Festival. When we think about human intelligence, a lot of the time we focus on things like language or our cognitive skills, how good we are at math. But really, a lot of our brain has been developed in order to just move our bodies. And so I think that that level of intelligence, motor intelligence, movement intelligence, this is a core part of our intelligence, and that's what our cognitive skills are built on top of. This focus on creating intelligent robots which can learn for themselves is part of the reason why DeepMind's robots might seem a little bit, well, rudimentary compared to what else is out there. Because I'm sure that all of you are thinking about those videos on the internet of robots doing backflips, being pushed over, getting back up, performing all kinds of incredibly sophisticated movements. So I thought I'd ask Raya Hadsell about this. You can't believe everything you see on the internet, Anna. (laughs) Well put. You're absolutely right. There are robots that can do some pretty impressive stuff that can flip, that can jump. At DeepMind, we've been focusing more on the generality aspect of it, the G in AGI. We want robots that can 
learn new things that they've never done before without needing somebody to program them just through experience or through watching a human. So those very impressive videos, the ones that aren't fake of robots doing backflips, they are essentially following a very precise set of instructions. Is that essentially what we're saying? Absolutely. And they tend to be a demonstration of what that actual robot can do. A robot that can do a backflip, that's very impressive because of the power and mass ratio that's required to do that. But it's very different from wanting that robot to do a new skill that it has just observed for the first time. It couldn't walk over to a table and pick up a coffee cup, for example. It could not. Well, you've disappointed me, Raya. (laughs) (laughs) But yours could, in theory, in future. Ours could do that and... Weed potatoes and pick tomatoes as well. This is the key point here. If robots can teach themselves to manipulate objects and move around, they can be adaptable and offer assistance to humans in a whole host of critical tasks, including situations where they can't currently support us. So this came up when there was the Fukushima disaster in Japan. There's been an explosion at a Japanese nuclear power station damaged in yesterday's massive earthquake. Clouds of smoke could be seen rising above the Fukushima nuclear site. People realized that we didn't have a good way to send robots into this extremely dangerous radioactive area and make repairs because all of our robots either required an area that was easily accessible or didn't have the necessary dexterity to, for instance, shut a valve or open a door. And so there was a whole robotics program aimed at how do we improve legged locomotion into areas where a wheeled robot can't go, and how do we improve the dexterity of robots as well. Of course, there is a flip side here. If, in the future, these artificially intelligent robots are good enough to be deployed in the real world for saving human lives. They could also be built to do the opposite. Robots have been used to carry weapons. And so if you make a more capable robot, then potentially what you're making is a more capable vehicle for holding weapons. Of course, DeepMind is very much against autonomous weaponry, including on robots. And I think that the benefits of robots and what they can do in our world outweigh these risks, especially if the world stands strongly against the use of weaponry and robotics. And this is not the only ethical concern about robotics research. Lots of people are worried about the possible detrimental effects of automation on the workforce. What we're looking at now with the use of robots would be to augment humans. Somebody working on a construction site that has a robot next to them that's able to do some of the heavy lifting, for instance. So it's not about displacing humans or replacing them, it's about enhancing what a human can do. Any robot that's going to help with weeding potatoes and picking tomatoes will, of course, need to have mastered locomotion. Back at the DeepMind Robotics Lab, a recent focus has been to develop a robot which can move around on two legs, a problem which comes with its own unique set of research challenges. On the floor, we've got what looks sort of like the playmat that you put down for kids. Akil showed me a sort of robot playpen, about nine metres squared with a barrier around it, presumably to stop the robots inside from escaping. So inside this square, then, you've got three humanoid robots. They're black, they've got a very cuboid body, but they have arms and legs and even little tiny heads. They're quite small, though, I should tell you that. They're probably the size of a large chicken. (laughs) Yeah, smaller than a goose, bigger than a chicken, I don't know. (laughs) And basically, what we've been doing is, is learning to walk around. And so, like, robot actually learns to kind of use its legs and even its arms... The head has a camera, so it learns to kind of look around and see what's going on. So it is very much kind of almost like a whole body control problem in some sense. Can I touch it? You can hold it. Oh my gosh. Okay. Oh, it's quite heavy. It's got these little handles on the back, almost like a rucksack. 
uh, and lots of ports like little USB ports and an Ethernet cable port and stuff. And then for feet, it's got these little skid pads, almost like it's going skiing, but just with really short skis. It's very pretty. So I'm lifting its arm up now and it kind of returns to centre, but it's got this really like smooth action. Have a listen to that. Like a really sad sort of like, oh, please leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's walking around. Imagine if you were doing a really rubbish robot dance in a nightclub. That is exactly what it looks like. It looks like it should fall over. <laughs> so you haven't programmed this to walk around in a circle? No, this was learned on the robot just by learning from the data over a couple of days. That's Jan Humplik, a research scientist at DeepMind who's been following the progress of these humanoid robots for more than a year. Did you teach it to fall flat on its back like it just did? <laughs> no, it just falls. It's quite good at pushing itself up though. Yeah, so those things are programmed. The pushing behavior to stand up, that's programmed. Because otherwise you'd just spend your entire life picking up the robot. Well, either we'd need to pick them up or they would need to learn to stand up. We are kind of humanizing them by giving them names. <laughs> Viorica Prochochen is another research scientist on the Locomotion Project. What are their names of these three? I think one of them is England and one is Messi from the Messi the footballer. And mine's called Haji. Uh, that's from Humane de GI. Or the Haji the great uh, Romanian footballer. <laughs> Just because I'm from Romania originally. Oh, cool. so. so if you look at that one, this is a completely different training process. And you can see that the gait is very different. <laughs> and it can try to walk backwards and it's actually... It looks like it's a drunk robot. So it's trying to walk backwards, but it's sort of, um, it's just yeah, giving up. Think, okay, I think it's it died. Up, and it's really <laughs> forlorn. I must say, I could have stood watching these cute and mostly completely hopeless little humanoid robots all day. But I wanted to find out more about the process of training them to walk. So after waving goodbye to England, Messi and co, I asked Jan and Viorica about their experience of training these robots in their living rooms at home when the pandemic hit. How does it travel? Does it just pop in a little suitcase? Actually, if you buy it, you get it with a suitcase. It comes with it, so it can travel. Do you have quite a big living room? Not that big, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I'm adapting it. I have a pen there with floor mats and uh, foam walls. So when you watch TV at night time, you sort of put your feet up and around you is a little robot pen. Exactly, yeah. We even had experiments where the robot was watching TV. Did you really? <laughs> well, we wanted to run some experiments to test visual networks. TV is a good source of diverse visual data. And it's already in the living room, right? So why not? <laughs> so hang on. Your job <laughs> over the last year has been sit on the sofa and watch TV with your robots. <laughs> not quite that, but <laughs> probably a few seconds of it. It does look like that, yeah. <laughs> so how do you train a humanoid robot to walk? Again, the underlying mechanism is reinforcement learning. The robots are rewarded with points for forward velocity and not falling over. When you haven't given them any training, what do they do? Oh, they don't do much. They just uh, start shaking uh, for one second or two at most, and then they fall. After uh, training for a few hours, then they start uh, actually walking, like taking a few steps. And then later on, uh, they bump into walls and then using vision, they learn how to avoid the walls. So I, I have a two-year-old at home, right? And like, the way you're describing it, it's not dissimilar from the way that the two-year-old has learned to walk. There's a lot of falling, not that much shaking, <laughs> sort of twitching and flailing. But there was also a lot of walking into walls. Do you see those similarities with the way that these robots learn to walk and the way that toddlers learn? There are some similarities, but probably for toddlers, even before they crawl, they still discover their body, they still learn to move their limbs. Whereas our robots, we just uh, put them in standing position and now walk. <laughs> <laughs> and how quickly did it manage to learn to walk? I think in about 24 hours, it was already walking. For me, that's impressive. Not 24 hours in real time, but 24 hours in sort of training time. Yeah, yeah. That spans about a week of training, but uh, training like in small uh, sessions before something breaks or taking it to the lab for a quick repair or something like that. Viorica raises an important point about the fragility of these robots. 
The actual hardware is not designed for a machine learning technique which involves a robot falling down loads of times before any progress is made. Here's Raya Hansel to explain. The robots that are built today are not built for the type of learning paradigms that we think is key to developing AGI. Think about when a child learns to walk. Every time they fall down, they then heal from that and they keep on going. There's only so many times that a robot can fall down before it simply breaks. This approach comes with all kinds of difficulties and hurdles that the pre-programmed robots just don't have to worry about. Here's Jan Humplik again. The main limitation is that you really start from scratch. With more classical approaches, you perhaps don't need any data. It's just going to work out of the box. So these are certainly disadvantages of reinforcement learning. Can't you cheat, though? Can't what one robot has learned about the world be imparted onto another? Absolutely. And there are many different ways to share knowledge. In particular, you can just have multiple robots collecting data, and this is really the way to scale up this data collection process. What Jan is talking about here is a technique called pooling. Instead of Haji and England learning to walk independently of each other, their data, how many times they fell over, what their sensor readings were when they fell, etc., is regularly uploaded to a central controller, which combines this information and feeds it back to each robot so that they can better navigate the world based on their combined learning experience. We can track each robot, how well they're doing. And yeah, we definitely discuss like, oh, okay, my robot starts falling more often now. Uh, is yours the same? Did it get quite competitive? <laughs> <laughs> I kept telling everybody that it's not a competition. But yeah. yes, every time somebody would cheat the learning curves and there would be the two robots, they would be like, oh, Viorica is winning. Oh, Jan is winning. <laughs> I'm like, no, no. <laughs> We're only winning if the performances are the same on both robots. <laughs> Speaking of teamwork, there are other environments, beyond just walking around or inserting keys into locks or stacking bricks, that serve as an important test project for the robots. A chance to hone in on a set of robot skills that would be useful to have in the long term. For that, in true DeepMind fashion, their focus has turned to games. And one in particular. The beautiful game. In order to play football, you have to be able to control your body. You need to be able to run, to walk. But then you also need to have these skills of dribbling and shooting. And then at even a level above that, you need to have the coordination and the strategy over the whole game. So it's really a challenge that has a lot of layers to it. So far, DeepMind has been teaching football not to real robots, but to simulated ones, computerized avatars in human form, a bit like a simplified version of the players in your favorite video game. The difference with these players is that their repertoire of movements is not pre-programmed, but like the real robots, they are effectively learning to move from scratch. The point is not to have robots playing at Wembley Stadium in the near future, however fun that might be. We're really trying to study whether it's valuable to train these methods using reward and the competition of something like football, or whether there are other ways to train for this type of behavior. Underneath that big umbrella of reinforcement learning, it's helpful to use a series of other techniques to get the agents up and running. Here, they're also using something called imitation learning, which involves gathering video footage from real human football matches using motion capture to translate the movements of each player's joints into a data set, and then training a neural network so that these simulated humanoids begin to mimic the movements of real players. So this is really layering these different types of learning algorithms together. And the exciting thing is that the result in the end is for agents that can race around this field, and they've really achieved this level of whole body control and also team coordination. And then Raya showed me my first ever video of a simulated humanoid football match. And I'll do my best to commentate on the highlights. 
So here we are for this season's title decider between these two titans of AI football, the Blues versus Humanoids United playing in red. Well, the game's begun and Drogbot has it for the Blues. Cuts inside and then chops back onto his right. But look, the ball has broken free and Robo Naldo is clear. Go! Well, they say a week is a long time in politics, but five seconds really is an epoch in AI football. As impressive as this video is, Raya, I think it's fair to say that at certain points they are quite hilariously bad at controlling their bodies. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they are not trying to win any points on style or grace. <laughs> no, no. So that really lets the agent optimize for just purely trying to achieve its goal. It doesn't matter if the arms are flailing around. So you can see the problem with putting this onto a real robot. <laughs> yeah, I can see how that would be a problem with the robots. It's in the game of football that we start to see the different flavours of intelligence converge. Training agents to play football gives them physical skills like dribbling and passing, but when combined with a reinforcement learning algorithm, which rewards them for team play, you start to see emerging the sort of cooperative AI we heard about in the previous episode. The question is, if physical and social intelligence can be developed in tandem in this way, could physical intelligence provide a path all the way to AGI? It all depends on how you define AGI, doesn't it? I've noticed this a lot, yes. Maybe not immediately. You know, if you look at evolution, it's a very long path to go from initial creatures to human beings. Then I think also it could be a very long path if we want to build an AGI starting from first principles of learning to move a body. But that is what we are looking at. Jan Humplik also believes that it will be a long time before robotics takes us to a general form of intelligence. If I ask somebody on the street, what would they be impressed by the robot doing? They would say something like, well, you know, maybe cleaning my apartment. And, and if you start thinking about this problem, you're like, OK, so it certainly needs to use vision. It certainly needs to understand human language because you need to give it command. It needs to understand what does it mean to clean the apartment. And that's not trivial because cleaning doesn't mean destroying your furniture. Solving anything impressive like this is essentially getting very close to AGI. But if embodied intelligence, social intelligence and linguistic intelligence don't necessarily lead to AGI on their own, is there a single path that does? Well, some DeepMind researchers are convinced that there is, and it's been staring us in the face this whole time. When we say that reward is enough, we're really arguing that all of the abilities of intelligence, everything from perception, to knowledge, to social intelligence, to language, can be understood as a single process of trying to increase the rewards that that agent gets. If this hypothesis was true, it would mean that we only need to solve one problem in intelligence rather than a thousand different problems for each of the separate abilities. That's next time on the DeepMind podcast, presented by me, Hannah Fry and produced by Dan Hardoon at Whistledown Productions. If you like what you've heard, please do rate and review the podcast. Helps others who are also AI curious to find it. Same time next week. <laughs>